Chapter 3 of How I Found Livingstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 3 Organization of the Expedition. I was totally ignorant of the interior, and it was difficult at first to know what I needed in order to take an expedition into Central Africa. Time was precious also, and much of it could not be devoted to inquiry and investigation. In a case like this, it would have been a godsend, I thought, had either of the three gentlemen, Captains Burton, Speak, or Grant, given some information on these points, had they devoted a chapter upon how to get ready for an expedition for Central Africa. The purpose of this chapter, then, is to relate how I said about it, that other travelers coming after me may have the benefit of my experience. These are some of the questions I asked myself as I tossed on my bed at night. How much money is required? How many pagazis or carriers? How many soldiers? How much cloth? How many beads? How much wire? What kinds of cloth are required for the different tribes? Ever so many questions to myself brought me no clearer the exact point I wished to arrive at. I scribbled over scores of sheets of paper, made estimates, threw out lists of material, calculated the cost of keeping 100 men for one year, at so many yards of different kinds of cloth, etc. I studied Burton, Speak, and Grant in vain. A good deal of geographical, ethnological, and other information appertaining to the study of Inner Africa was obtainable, but information respecting the organization of an expedition requisite before proceeding to Africa was not in any book. The Europeans at Zanzibar knew as little as possible about this particular point. There was not one white man at Zanzibar who could tell how many dotis a day a force of 100 men required to buy food for one day on the road. Neither, indeed, was it their business to know. But what should I do at all? This was a grand question. I decided it were best to hunt up an Arab merchant who had been engaged in the ivory trade or who was fresh from the interior. Sheikh Hasid was a man of note and of wealth in Zanzibar. He himself dispatched several caravans into the interior and was necessarily acquainted with several prominent traders who came to his house to gossip about their adventures and gains. He was also the proprietor of the large house Captain Webb occupied. Besides, he lived across the narrow street which separated his house from the consulate. Of all men, Sheikh Hashid was the man to be consulted and he was accordingly invited to visit me at the consulate. From the grey-bearded and venerable-looking sheep, I elicited more information about African currency, the mode of procedure, the quantity and quality of stuffs I required, than I had obtained from three months' study of books upon Central Africa. And from other Arab merchants to whom the ancient sheep introduced me, I received most valuable suggestions and hints, which enabled me at last to organize an expedition. The reader must bear in mind that a traveler requires only that which is sufficient for travel and exploration, that a superfluity of goods or means will prove as fatal to him as poverty of supplies. It is on this question of quality and quantity that the traveler has first to exercise his judgment and discretion. My informants gave me to understand that for 100 men, 10 doti or 40 yards of cloth per diem would suffice for food. The proper course to pursue, I found, was to purchase 2,000 doti of American cheating, 1,000 doti of Kaniki, and 650 doti of the colored cloth, such as Persaki, a great favorite in the Unamwezi, Sahari, taken in Ugogo, Ishmahili, Tajiri, Joho, Shas, Rahani, Jamdini, or Kanguru Kutch, blue and pink. These were deemed amply sufficient for the subsistence of 100 men for 12 months. Two years at this rate would require 4,000 doti equal to 16,000 yards of American cheating, 2,000 doti equal to 8,000 yards of kaniki, 1,300 doti equal to 5,200 yards of mixed colored cloth. This was definite and valuable information to me, and accepting the lack of some suggestions as to the quality of the sheeting, kaniki, and colored cloths, I had obtained all I desired upon this point. Second in importance to the amount of cloth required was the quantity and quality of the beads necessary. Beads, I was told, took the place of cloth currency among some tribes of the interior. One tribe preferred white to black beads, brown to yellow, red to green, green to white, and so on. Thus, in Unhamwezi, red Sami Sami beads would readily be taken, where all other kinds would be refused. Black Wubu beads, though currency in Ugogo, were positively worthless with all other tribes. The egg, Sungumasi beads, 
though valuable in Ujiji and Ugaha, would be refused in all other countries. The white Marikani beads, though good in Ufipa, in some parts of Usagara and Ugogo, would certainly be despised in Usaguha and Uganango. Such being the case, I was obliged to study closely and calculate the probable stay of an expedition in the several countries, so as to be sure to provide a sufficiency of each kind, and guard against any great overplus. Burton and Speke, for instance, were obliged to throw away as worthless several hundred fundo of beads. For example, supposing the several nations of Europe had each its own currency, without the means of exchange, and supposing a man was about to travel through Europe on foot, before starting he would be apt to calculate how many days it would take him to travel through France, how many through Prussia, Austria, and Russia, then to reckon the expense he would be likely to incur per day. If the expense be set down at a Napoleon per day, and his journey through France would occupy 30 days, the sum required for going and returning might be properly set down at 60 Napoleons, in which case, Napoleons not being current money in Prussia, Austria, or Russia, it would be utterly useless for him to burden himself with the weight of a couple thousand Napoleons in gold. My anxiety on this point was most excruciating. Over and over I studied the hard names and measures, conned again and again the polysyllables, hoping to be able to arrive sometime at an intelligible definition of the terms. I revolved in my mind the words Muganguro, Gulabio, Sungomazi, Kadanduguru, Matunda, Sami Sami, Bubu, Merikani, Hafta, Lungkio Rega, and Lakio until I was fairly beside myself. Finally, however, I came to the conclusion that if I reckoned my requirements at 50 kahit or 5 fundo per day for two years, and if I purchased only 11 varieties, I might consider myself safe enough. The purchase was accordingly made, and 22 sacks of the best species were packed and brought to Captain Webb's house, ready for transportation to Bagamoyo. After the beads came the wire question. I discovered, after considerable trouble, that numbers 5 and 6, almost the thickness of telegraph wire, were considered the best numbers for trading purposes. While beads stand for copper coins in Africa, cloth measures for silver, wire is reckoned as gold in the countries beyond the Tanganyika. 10 frashala, or 350 pounds, of brass wire, my Arab advisor thought, would be ample. Having purchased the cloth, the beads, and the wire, it was with no little pride that I surveyed the comely bales and packages lying piled up, row above row, in Captain Webb's capacious storeroom. Yet my work was not ended, it was but beginning. There were provisions, cooking utensils, boats, rope, twine, tents, donkeys, saddles, bagging, canvas, tar, needles, tools, ammunition, guns, equipments, hatchets, medicines, bedding, presents for chiefs, in short, a thousand things not yet purchased. The ordeal of chaffering and haggling with steel-hearted banyans, Hindis, Arabs, and half-castes was most trying. For instance, I purchased 22 donkeys at Zanzibar. 40 and 50 dollars were asked, which I had to reduce to 15 or 20 dollars by an infinite amount of argument, worthy, I think, of a nobler cause. As was my experience with the ass dealers, so it was with the petty merchants. Even a paper of pins was not purchased without a 5% reduction from the price demanded, involving, of course, a loss of time and patience. After collecting the donkeys, I discovered there were no pack saddles to be obtained in Zanzibar. Donkeys without pack saddles were of no use whatever. I invented a saddle to be manufactured by myself and my white man, Farquhar, wholly from canvas, rope, and cotton. Three or four frasillas of cotton and ten bolts of canvas were required for the saddles. A specimen saddle was made by myself in order to test its efficiency. A donkey was taken and saddled and a load of 140 pounds was fastened to it. And though the animal, a wild creature of Onyamwezi, struggled and reared frantically, not a particle gave way. After this experiment, Farquhar was set to work to manufacture 21 more after the same pattern. Woolen pads were also purchased to protect the animals from being galled. It ought to be mentioned here, perhaps, that the idea of such a saddle as I manufactured was first derived from the Otago saddle in use among the transport trains of the English army in Abyssinia. A man named John William Shaw, a native of London, England, lately third mate of the American ship Nevada, applied to me for work. Though his discharge from the Nevada was rather suspicious, yet he possessed all the requirements of such a man as I needed, and was an experienced hand with the palm and needle, could cut canvas to fit anything, was a pretty good navigator, ready and willing, so far as his professions went. 
I saw no reason to refuse his services, and he was accordingly engaged at $300 per annum to rank second to William L. Farquhar. Farquhar was a capital navigator and excellent mathematician, he was strong, energetic, and clever. The next thing I was engaged upon was to enlist, arm, and equip a faithful escort of 20 men for the road. Jahari, the chief dragoman of the American consulate, informed me that he knew where certain of Speke's faithfuls were yet to be found. The idea had struck me before that if I could obtain the services of a few men acquainted with the ways of white men, and who could induce other good men to join the expedition I was organizing, I might consider myself fortunate. More especially had I thought of Sidi Mubarak Mumbay, commonly called Bombay, who, though his head was woodeny and his hands clumsy, was considered to be the faithfulest of the faithfuls. With the aid of the dragoman Jahari, I secured in a few hours the services of Ulidi, Captain Grant's former valet, Ulamengo, Baruti, and Barry Mabruki, Munyi Mabruki, bullheaded Mabruki, Captain Burton's former unhappy valet, five of Speak's faithfuls. When I asked them if they were willing to join another white man's expeditions to Ujiji, they replied very readily that they were willing to join any brother of Speaks. Dr. John Kirk, Her Majesty's Council at Zanzibar, who was present, told him that though I was no brother of Speaks, I spoke his language. This distinction mattered little to them, and I heard them, with great delight, declare their readiness to go anywhere with me or to do anything I wished. Mombay, as they called him, or Bombay as we know him, had gone to Pemba, an island lying north of Zanzibar. Ulidi was sure Mombay would jump with joy at the prospect of another expedition. Jahari was therefore commissioned to write to him at Pemba, to inform him of the good fortune in store for him. On the fourth morning after the letter had been dispatched, the famous Bombay made his appearance, followed in decent order and due rank by the faithfuls of Speak. I looked in vain for the woodeny head and alligator teeth with which his former master had endowed him. I saw a slender short man of fifty or thereabouts, with a grizzled head, an uncommonly high narrow forehead, with a very large mouth showing teeth very irregular and wide apart. An ugly rent in the upper front row of Bombay's teeth was made with the clenched fist of Captain Speak in Uganda, when his master's patience was worn out, and prompt punishment became necessary. That Captain Speak had spoiled him with kindness was evident, from the fact that Bombay had the audacity to stand up for a boxing match with him. But these things I only found out when, months afterwards, I was called upon to administer punishment to him myself. But at his first appearance, I was favorably impressed with Bombay, though his face was rugged, his mouth large, his eyes small, and his nose flat. Salam aliki dama, were the words he greeted me with. Aliki kam salam, I replied, with all the gravity I could muster. I then informed him I required him as captain of my soldiers to Ujiji. His reply was that he was ready to do whatever I told him, go wherever I like, in short, be a pattern to servants and a model to soldiers. He hoped I would give him a uniform and a good gun, both of which were promised. Upon inquiring for the rest of the faithfuls who accompanied Speak into Egypt, I was told that at Zanzibar there were but six. Faraji, Maktab, Sadiq, Sanguru, Manyu, Matashari, Makata, and Almas were dead. Yulidi and Matamani were in Anyanyembi, Hassan had gone to Kilwa, and Farahan was supposed to be in Ujiji. Out of the six faithfuls, each of whom still retained his medal for assisting in the discovery of the sources of the Nile, one, poor Mabruki, had met with a sad misfortune, which I feared would incapacitate him from active usefulness. Mabruki, the bullheaded, owned a shamba, or a house with a garden attached to it, of which he was very proud. Close to him lived a neighbor in similar circumstances, who was a soldier of Said Majid, with whom Mabruki, who was of a quarrelsome disposition, had a feud, which culminated in the soldier inducing two or three of his comrades to assist him in punishing the malevolent Mabruki, and this was done in a manner that only the heart of an African could conceive. They tied the unfortunate fellow by his wrist to a branch of a tree, and after indulging their brutal appetite for revenge in torturing him, left him to hang in that position for two days. At the expiration of the second day, he was accidentally discovered in a most pitiable condition. His hands had swollen to an immense size, and the veins of one hand had been ruptured. He had lost its use. It is needless to say that, when the affair came to Said Majid's ears, the miscreants were severely punished. Dr. Kirk, who attended the poor fellow, succeeded in restoring one hand to something of a semblance of its former shape, but the other hand is sadly marred and its former usefulness gone forever. 
However, I engaged Mabruki, despite his deformed hands, his ugliness and vanity, because he was one of Speke's faithfuls. For if he but wagged his tongue in my service, kept his eyes open, and opened his mouth at the proper time, I assured myself I could make him useful. Bombay, my captain of escort, succeeded in getting eighteen more free men to volunteer as Oscari, soldiers, men whom he knew would not desert, and for whom he declared himself responsible. They were an exceedingly fine-looking body of men, far more intelligent in appearance than I could ever have believed African barbarians could be. They hailed principally from Yuhuyo, others from Unamwisi, some came from Yusaguha and Ugindo. Their wages were set down at $36 each man per annum, or $3 each per month. Each soldier was provided with a flintlock musket, powder horn, bullet pouch, knife, and hatchet, besides enough powder and ball for 200 rounds. Bombay, in consideration of his rank and previous faithful services to Burton, Speak, and Grant, was engaged at $80 a year, half that sum in advance. A good muzzle-loading rifle besides a pistol, knife, and hatchet were given to him, while the other five faithfuls, Ambari, Mabruki, Ulamengo, Baruti, and Yulida, were engaged at $40 a year, with proper equipments as soldiers. Having studied fairly well all the East African travelers' books regarding Eastern and Central Africa, my mind had conceived the difficulties which would present themselves during the prosecution of my search after Dr. Livingstone. To obviate all of these, as well as human work could suggest, was my constant thought and aim. Shall I permit myself, while looking from Ujiji over the waters of the Tanganyika Lake to the other side, to be balked on the threshold of success by the insolence of a King Hanina, or the caprice of a Hamid bin Sulayam? was a question I asked myself. To guard against such a contingency, I determined to carry my own boats. Then, I thought, if I hear of Livingstone being on the Tanganyika, I can launch my boat and proceed after him. I procured one large boat, capable of carrying twenty persons, with stores and goods sufficient for a cruise from the American consul for the sum of eighty dollars, and a smaller one from another American gentleman for forty dollars. The latter would hold comfortably six men with suitable stores. I did not intend to carry the boats whole or bodily, but to strip them of their boards and carry the timbers and thwarts only. As a substitute for the boards, I proposed to cover each boat with a double canvas skin well tarred. The work of stripping them and taking them to pieces fell to me. This little job occupied me five days. I also packed them up for the pagazis. Each load was carefully weighed, and none exceeded 68 pounds in weight. John Shaw excelled himself in the workmanship displayed on the canvas boats. When finished, they fitted their frames admirably. The canvas, six bolts of English hemp number three, was procured from Ludha Damji, who furnished it from the Sultan's storeroom. An insuperable obstacle to rapid transit in Africa is the want of carriers, and as speed was the main object of the expedition under my command, my duty was to lessen this difficulty as much as possible. My carriers could only be engaged after arriving at Bagamoyo on the mainland. I had over 20 good donkeys ready, and I thought a cart adapted for the footpaths of Africa might prove an advantage. Accordingly, I had a cart constructed, 18 inches wide and 5 feet long, supplied with two four-wheels of a light American wagon, more for the purpose of conveying the narrow ammunition boxes. I estimated that if a donkey could carry to Yunanyembe a load of four frezzolas or 140 pounds, he ought to be able to draw eight frezzolas on such a cart, which would be equal to the carrying capacity of four stout bagazis or carriers. Events were proved, and my theories were borne out in practice. When my purchases were completed and I beheld them piled up, tier after tier, row upon row, here a mass of cooking utensils, there bundles of rope, tents, saddles, a pile of portmanteaus and boxes, containing every imaginable thing, I confess I was rather abashed at my own temerity. Here were at least six tons of material. How will it ever be possible, I thought, to move all this inert mass across the wilderness stretching between the sea and the Great Lakes of Africa? Bah! Cast all doubts away, man, and have at them. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof, without borrowing from the morrow. The traveler must needs make his way into the African interior after a fashion very different from that to which he has been accustomed in other countries. He requires to take with him just what a ship must have when about to sail on a long voyage. He must have his slop chest, his little store of canned dainties, and his medicines, besides which he must have enough guns, powder, and ball to be able to make a series of good fights if necessary. 
He must have men to convey these miscellaneous articles, and as a man's maximum load does not exceed 70 pounds, to convey 11,000 pounds requires nearly 160 men. Europe and the Orient, even Arabia and Turkestan, have royal ways of traveling compared to Africa. Specie is received in all those countries by which a traveler may carry his means about him on his own person. Eastern and Central Africa, however, demand a necklace instead of a cent, two yards of American sheeting instead of half a dollar or a florin, and a kitindi of thick brass wire in place of a gold piece. The African traveler can hire neither wagons nor camels, neither horses nor mules, to proceed with him into the interior. His means of conveyance are limited to black and naked men, who demand at least $15 a head for every 70 pounds weight carried only as far as Yuhanyembe. One thing amongst others my predecessors omitted to inform men bound for Africa, which is of importance, and that is, that no traveler should ever think of coming to Zanzibar with his money in any other shape than gold coin. Letters of credit, circular notes, and such civilized things I have found to be a century ahead of Zanzibar people. Twenty and twenty-five cents deducted out of every dollar I drew on paper is one of the unpleasant, if not unpleasantest, things I have committed to lasting memory. For Zanzibar is a spot far removed from all avenues of European commerce, and coin is at a high premium. A man may talk and entreat, but though he may have drafts, checks, circular notes, letters of credit, a carte blanche to get what he wants, out of every dollar must be deducted 25 and 30 cents, so I was told, and so was my experience. What a pity there is no branch bank here. I had intended to have gone into Africa incognito, but the fact that a white man, even an American, was about to enter Africa was soon known all over Zanzibar. This fact was repeated a thousand times in the streets, proclaimed in all the shop alcoves and at the custom house. The native bazaar laid hold of it and agitated it day and night until my departure. The foreigners, including the Europeans, wished to know the pros and cons of my coming in and going out. My answer to all questions, pertinent and impertinent, was, I am going to Africa. Though my card bore the words, Henry M. Stanley, New York Herald, very few, I believe, ever coupled the words, New York Herald, with a search after Dr. Livingstone. It was not my fault, was it? Ah, me. What hard work it is to start an expedition alone. What with hurrying through the baking heat of the fierce, relentless sun from shop to shop, strengthening myself with far-reaching and enduring patience for the haggling contest with the livid-faced Hindi, summoning courage and wit to browbeat the villainous villainese and match the foxy banyan, talking volumes throughout the day, correcting estimates, making up accounts, superintending the delivery of purchased articles, measuring and weighing them to see that everything was of full measure and weight, overseeing the white men, Pakahar and Shaw, who were busy on donkey saddles, sails, tents and boats for the expedition, I felt, when the day was over, as though limbs and brain well deserved their rest. Such labors were mine unremittingly for a month. Having bartered drafts on Mr. James Gordon Bennett to the amount of several thousand dollars for cloth, beads, wire, donkeys, and a thousand necessaries, having advanced pay to the white men and black escort of the expedition, having fretted Captain Webb and his family more than enough with the din of preparation, and filled his house with my goods, there was nothing further to do but to leave my formal adieus with the Europeans, and thank the Sultan and those gentlemen who had assisted me before embarking for Bagamoyo. The day before my departure from Zanzibar, the American consul, having just habited himself in his black coat, and taking with him an extra black hat in order to be in state apparel, proceeded with me to the Sultan's palace. The prince had been generous to me. He had presented me with an Arab horse, had furnished me with letters of introduction to his agents, his chief men, and representatives in the interior, and in many other ways had shown himself well disposed towards me. The palace is a large, roomy, lofty square house close to the fort, built of coral and plastered thickly with lime mortar. In appearance, it is half Arabic and half Italian. The shutters are Venetian blinds painted a vivid green and presenting a striking contrast to the whitewashed walls. Before the great, lofty, wide door were ranged in two crescents several Baluk and Persian mercenaries, armed with curved swords and targes of rhinoceros hide. Their dress consisted of a muddy white cotton shirt reaching to the ankles, girdled with a leather belt thickly studded with silver bosses. As we came in sight, a signal was passed to some person inside the entrance. 
When within twenty yards of the door, the sultan, who was standing waiting, came down the steps, and passing through the ranks, advanced toward us, with his right hand stretched out, and a genial smile of welcome on his face. On our side we raised our hats and shook hands with him, after which, doing according as he bade us, we passed forward, and arrived on the highest step near the entrance door. He pointed forward, we bowed, and arrived at the foot of an unpainted and narrow staircase, to turn once more to the sultan. The consul, I perceived, was ascending sideways, a mode of progression which I saw was intended for a compromise with decency and dignity. At the top of the stairs we waited, with our faces towards the upcoming prince. Again we were waved magnanimously forward, for before us was the reception hall and throne room. I noticed as I marched forward to the furthest end that the room was high and painted in the Arabic style, that the carpet was thick and of Persian fabric, that the furniture consisted of a dozen gilt chairs and a chandelier. We were seated. Ludha Damji, the Banyan collector of customs, a venerable-looking old man with a shrewd, intelligent face, sat on the right of the sultan. Next to him was the great Mohammedan merchant Tarya Tapan, who had come to be present at the interview, not only because he was one of the counselors of his highness, but because he also took a lively interest in this American expedition. Opposite to Ludha sat Captain Webb, and next to him I was seated, opposite Tarya Tapan. The sultan sat in a gilt chair between the Americans and the counselors. Jahari the dragoman stood humbly before the sultan, expectant and ready to interpret what we had to communicate to the prince. The sultan, so far as dress goes, might be taken for a Mingrelian gentleman, excepting, indeed, for the turban, whose ample folds in alternate colors of red, yellow, brown, and white encircled his head. His long robe was of dark cloth, cinctured round the waist with his rich sword belt, from which was suspended a gold-hilted scimitar, encased in a scabbard also enriched with gold. His legs and feet were bare, and had a ponderous look about them, since he suffered from that strange curse of Zanzibar, elephantiasis. His feet were slipped into a pair of wada, Arabic for slippers, with thick soles and a strong leathern band over the instep. His light complexion and his correct features, which are intelligent and regular, bespeak the Arab patrician. They indicate, however, nothing except his high descent and blood. No traits of character are visible, unless there is just a trace of amiability and perfect contentment with himself and all around. Such is Prince, or Sayed Bergash, Sultan of Zanzibar and Pemba, in the east coast of Africa, from Somaliland to the Mozambique, as he appeared to me. Coffee was served in cups supported by golden finges, also some coconut milk, and rich sweet sherbet. The conversation began with the question addressed to the council. Are you well? Council. Yes, thank you. How is his highness? Highness. Quite well. Highness to me. Are you well? Answer. Quite well, thanks. The council now introduces business, and questions about my travels follow from his highness. How do you like Persia? Have you seen Karbala Baghdad, Messer, Stambul? Have the Turks many soldiers? How many has Persia? Is Persia fertile? How do you like Zanzibar? Having answered each question to His Highness's satisfaction, he handed me letters of introduction to his officers at Bagamoyo and Kaoli, and a general introductory letter to all Arab merchants whom I might meet on the road, and concluded his remarks to me with the expressed hope that on whatever mission I was bound I should be perfectly successful. We bowed ourselves out of his presence in much the same manner that we had bowed ourselves in, he accompanying us to the great entrance door. Mr. Goodhue of Salem, an American merchant long resident in Zanzibar, presented me, as I gave him my adieu, with a blooded bay horse imported from the Cape of Good Hope, and worth, at least at Zanzibar, $500. February 4. By the 4th of February, 28 days from the date of my arrival at Zanzibar, the organization and equipment of the New York Herald Expedition was complete. Tents and saddles had been manufactured, boats and sails were ready. The donkeys brayed and the horses neighed impatiently for the road. Etiquette demanded that I should once more present my card to the European and American consuls at Zanzibar, and the word farewell was said to everybody. On the fifth day, four dows were anchored before the American consulate. Into one were lifted the two horses, into two others the donkeys, into the fourth, the largest, the black escort, and bulky monies of the expedition. A little before noon, we set sail. The American flag, a present to the expedition by that kind-hearted lady, Mrs. Webb, 
was raised to the masthead. The consul, his lady, and exuberant little children, Mary and Charlie, were on the housetop waving the starry banner, hats and handkerchiefs, a token of farewell to me and mine. Happy people and good. May their course and ours be prosperous, and may God's blessing rest on us all. End of chapter 3